Okay. Uh, uh, welcome everyone to ELC 2022 and thank you for coming to this uh, talk. Today I'll be talking about uh, V4L to M2M uh, framework and, and how you can use this uh, to write your driver if you have a video processing IP. Uh, let's start off with what is V4L to M2M, right? So it's a driver framework for memory to memory devices. Uh, so memory to memory devices are those that take data from memory, they do some processing in hardware, and then they write out the process data back, back into memory. So uh, this is slightly different from the normal the traditional V4L2 devices, which are either capture or output. Uh, typically a V4L2 M2M device would have both uh, output and capture uh, node. So think of it that way. And another additional thing that V4L2 M2M does is that it has uh, support for multiple contexts. So you can have multiple applications or even an application having multiple contexts and they could all share the same underlying hardware underneath. So this is technically possible even for capture and output devices, uh, but as such the framework doesn't directly support it, but the drivers can do it themselves. Um, a few images showing what I just described. Mem to mem, meaning like you have some data in DDR, you send, read it. The mem to mem device reads it, does some processing with it, and then writes out the output to another uh, mem piece of memory in the DDR. And how that differs from traditional V4L2 output devices, you typically read uh, the, the data and then send it out to an output device hardware. And if it was a capture device, uh, your output hardware would generate some frames or, and then that, that would be written back, in, back into memory, right? Uh, another thing to note here is this can be a bit confusing that uh, the, the terminology of V4L2 uses output and capture. Uh, and output typically might look like input and capture might seem like output. So these terms might, it might get interchangeable in this presentation and all across V4L2 documentation as well. And here, this is the M2M device, which does both. You know, it has an output as well as a capture. So let's take a look at a typical uh, V4L2 application workflow. So, so you'd have, uh, you know, you have the application layer. We have the V4L2 kernel API layer, and a driver typically interacts with. Uh, if, if it's a traditional V4L2, it, it interacts with the V4L2 core and, and the VB2 core. VB2 is the video buffer too, and it is the buffer manager for V4L2, and well, I'm not going into full details, but a very brief uh, uh, yeah, explanation on this. So what would happen is this typically a setup stage where you'd set up formats for, for your device. You'll allocate some buffers, and then you'll cause some sort of a state change. It begins streaming, right? And that's when the hardware starts producing data. Or if it's an output device, uh, software provides uh, data to the hardware, which then goes out to the output device. And then once that streaming state begins, uh, then you would probably have already queued some buffers into the stack beforehand. And then as and when uh, data is available, you dequeue the buffer back from the kernel to the application. And then that, that process keeps continuing as long as you are streaming. So that's, that's the typical workflow for any V4L2, whether output or capture. In M2M, you just do that twice. So you'd have one for an output. Uh, there'd be an output queue as well as capture queue and you keep cycling those buffers. So there's output buffers going to the output queue and capture buffers to the uh, uh, capture queue. And there's an additional core component that you deal with, which is the V4L2 M2M core. So driver not only interacts with V4L2 core, VB2 core, but also the V4L2 M2M core, which is basically a set of helpers that let you do all of this easily. So this, this, this slide shows the overall architecture of the V4L2 M2M architecture. So I mentioned earlier it's multi-context. So what, what we mean by multi-context is that, if, uh, and, the, and, and the way multi-context is implemented is, is very simple. If, every time you open the file descriptor, you get a context. And so and that's something to take care of. Sometimes as application developers, you'll open a file multiple times, but you've got to remember with M2M, you're going to get a new context if you do so. Um, and so that, that basically allows multiple applications to open multiple contexts, or even a single application to open multiple contexts. And each context can be thought of as a combination of a, a different job for that particular hardware, right? Different input set of uh, output and capture buffers. So the way it works here is uh, the, the application does maintain a set of buffers that it allocates with the help of the driver. 
it will maintain it uh, around in, 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 in its application space. And uh, at some point when it's ready, it's done all the format negotiations, it would push those buffers to the, to the kernel, through the kernel API. And VB2 is the component that receives it. So now once, uh, once VB2 has, uh, has these buffers, it's going to start making calls into the driver to queue those buffers. So those buffers are now intercepted by a, a helper function in V4L to M2M. And those queues move into something known as a ready queue, which is shown here in this purple box. And then each context has, uh, has its ready queue. And there's a ready queue for both output buffers as well as capture buffers. And then from here, uh, there is an evaluation that is done by the V4L to M2M framework, which just determines the eligibility for, for running. So uh, typically, for a very simplistic device, you need at least one output buffer and one capture buffer to complete the job. But that's not necessarily true. There are some codecs, uh, hardware, that might take two input buffers and produce one output buffer, or vice versa. Right? So, so that eligibility is uh, determined via a driver, driver callback. And when that eligibility is met, uh, you know, that context makes its way into a single job queue. Uh, and then the job queue, once it enters the job queue, then the framework uh, issues this context one at a time to the driver. And the driver will take out the job from it remove all the buffers, give it to hardware, do all the processing. And once it's done, it, it calls a bunch of finished calls, uh, which then go back to VB2, uh, and then also takes out the context from this queue. And then, you know, it's then, then ready to pick up the next contact in that queue. So this is a lot of information that I've put in here. But to better explain this, I uh, have an example. So, so I created, uh, I created an, uh, an example mem to mem scalar device. This is a good example of a uh, video processing IP. So we, it's a video scalar. So you can scale up or scale down, either one of them. And it is a virtual device. Uh, and it's, it's built with, uh, built with Kiemu. So it, it's, it's emulated using Kiemu. Um, the actual core logic for it is an, it's an open source project known as STB image resize library. And this this uh, this effort here uses Yocto Linux kernel 5.15, and it also it builds a device driver for this virtual device. And finally, there's also going to be an application uh, which uses libcamera C++ library, which has really good mem-to-mem -mem helpers uh, helpers. And then we'll demonstrate a simple downscaling example via this process. So let's start off with the actual uh, mem-to-mem -mem device. Every every hardware has a data sheet, hence there's a data sheet here as well. So this is for the virtual device. Uh, uh, it, it, it is virtual with respect to Kiemu, but to the driver, it looks real. So it has a register map. It has an interrupt. It also can do DMA. So, so that's what this data sheet is explaining. So the way you configure it is you know, there's a couple of input and output configuration registers. That's where you would go and program the, the input weights, heights, stride, output weights, heights, and stride. And then there are two DMA registers. One is for the input buffer itself. So this, this basically signals the, tells the hardware where to go and read the input buffer from, the, the actual physical address. And, and the output buffer DMA address tells the hardware where to go and write the finished output to. So that's the output buffer DMA address. And then there's one register, uh, like at offset uh, 18, which is for control and status. So, and there's a programming model described here. So typically what you do is you, you reset the IP and you, know, you, do, you do all this configuration beforehand, right? And uh, we, we'll set up all the widths and heights and everything you need. And, and then you uh, basically toggle that start bit. So that would cause the, the, the device to start doing the processing. So in KMU, what happens is it takes it uh, and uh, gives the job to a thread that's STB, which calls STB and gets the, downs, the image scaling done. And then after which it would issue an interrupt. And then the interrupt status bits are also inside that same register. So you, and while, while the KMU device model is doing all of its job, it will keep updating the status. When it's completely done, an interrupt would be issued. And it's either going to be a done or done with error. Uh, and you want it to be done. That, that means the job is successful. And you can pass it back to the application. Now let's like, take a look at the device driver that's been built for this device. So on the right side, I have the device tree. So like I said, there's a single IRQ line. Um, there is a register resource range. Uh, it says 1,000 here, but we do not have 1,000. Uh, that's just a random number. Don't, don't go into it too much. And this is a compatible string, which says this is a virtual device, and the type is a M2M scalar. Uh, 
and on the left side we have the platform we have a we have a platform driver built for this so that's uh, going to use the virtual m2m scalar compatible string as well and it'll have a probe and a remove method let's look further into the driver so in the probe method uh, one thing you do is you allocate a device private structure so that's shown over there you allocate it out of kernel memory uh, you'd get the platform uh, resources for the IOMM, the MMIO. You get that in here. Uh, then in this driver, we're also using regmaps uh, as a nice, because regmaps is a very new and very great API. We use that to program the hardware. It makes it very simpler. It, it very, particularly helps with those bit, uh, those bit fields that we have, you know, single register that has 16 bits for width and height. So with reg, reg fields, that, that becomes very, very easy to read. Uh, and then we also get uh, uh, acquire the IRQ line and install a handler here. So in this particular case, a threaded handler has been has been installed. Uh, this is because we we didn't want to use another uh, uh, deferred function in in, uh, in 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 the IRQ. And you can just if thread, and, and and for this particular use case, a threaded IRQ handler is good. Then the remaining, this is the remaining part of the probe function. Uh, we do have to call a v4l2 device register. Uh, and then we set up the driver private uh, data to both the video device as well as the platform platform device. Uh, and then there's a call to v4l2 m2m uh, to which we give the m2m ops. I think we'll review that in the next slide. We also have to call video device register. And at the end, we also enable interrupts because this driver requires interrupts for it to function. We cannot do polling over here. It's not possible. Uh, continuing with the probe method, we also have a media controller, um, um, what do you say, registration here. So media controller is supported by V4L, V4L uh, M2M. And uh, as far as my knowledge goes, it's mostly for the purposes of implementing media request API, um, but I think I don't want to go into media request API. That's that's out of scope for this presentation. But for those reasons, there is a media controller support. There may be more, but just I'm not aware of what the other reasons might be. Uh, there are, uh, and then let's let's go through the other ops. Uh, there are file ops uh, because the driver must be aware of when application is opening and releasing the device node, uh, so that it can create a context. Uh, rest of the Calls like poll, unlock, diagonal, and map are all pointing to uh, helper functions. We do have a scalar uh, video dev over here. This is the video device uh, data structure. And here we set up the caps and also a pointer to all the IOCTL ops. And this is the core ops, like the, 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 main, the, main, the most important ops for this driver. And there are actually three ops here. Only one has been implemented, which is the device run. There is another op to cancel, or abort, sorry, it's called abort. And, and the third one is called job ready, which is what I was mentioning earlier, that some, some hardwares will require more than one input buffer and output buff, uh, output and capture buffer to do the job, right? So in that case, if, if that is true for your uh, hardware, you must implement the, the devi device ready callback. And then, and then media controller uh, callbacks uh, ops are, are just uh, pointers to um, some helper functions. And these are needed for the request API, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, let's look at the F ops open. So uh, this is where the context actually gets created. So every time an application opens it, uh, you, you'd create a context and you'd store it into the file handle. That's what is shown here. So driver is very aware of this process, but it just makes use of the v4l2 m2m helpers to, to, to help it, to, you know, make, make it a lot easier. Uh, and there's an important step here, which is so the m2m context in it, to which you pass the queue in it uh, data. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a function uh, pointer and a couple of initialization is done there. So, and, and then the rest of it is boilerplate. You, all drivers would do this, so uh, uh, I, would, I, mean, we, I don't want to go into the details of that. Um, uh, the other steps that are done in open is uh, this particular driver uh, is caching the formats both for both the output as well as the capture. And those, those formats are stored inside that of context data structure itself, right? So in the event the application doesn't set anything, you should have some defaults to start off with, so that, that's what's being, being done over here. You can also see the context data structure over here. So it has a pointer to the original device, the file handle, which is where 
the context is stored and then the formats are stored in an array here and also a sequence number because as the driver progresses frame after frame a sequence number needs to be uh, incremented so this particular driver only supports uh, one uh, image pixel format and this one shown here which is rgb24 um, and uh, so that needs uh, that is what has been set up here as the default format in the release, what you do is you uninitialize and free up the context. So that's just pretty standard. And most drivers do this. Again, mostly boilerplate code here. Um, the queue init, we, we spoke about this in one of the previous slides. Uh, it's done as a part of the context, uh, the FOPs open, right? Where right after creating your context, you have to initialize that context. And this is where you're doing most of the VB2 related activity, right? here. So there's a source video queue and a destination video queue. The source is for the output uh, cap queues and destination is for the capture. And over here, you need to set up and determine what kind of a device you have, right? So, so here we have, we're telling this an output uh, and this is a capture. Uh, IO modes, we say MMAP and DMA buff. Th these are the most popular uh, uh, ones. And you have the driver private. Uh, we also do not need a special uh, uh, buffer struct size, so we, we can just go with the M2M -M standard buffer size here. And there's a few queue ops here. These are the VB2 uh, queue operations, right? And, and this one is important. This is telling, this depends on your hardware. So this particular uh, emulated KMU device can only do physically contiguous memory. So we'd use the VB2 DMA contig uh, mem ops. Again, this is coming from the VB2 layer. Uh, this, uh, they have, there's helpers for that. And then finally, you, you make a call into VB2 queue in it once you populated these data structures. Uh, so once uh, VB2, right before it starts allocating queues, it's going to make a call into the driver, which is known as the queue setup. Uh, what happens here is you need, you, as a driver developer, you need to tell it how many planes are there in the buffer and what's the size of each plane. So that's, that's what this driver is doing. The additional things could be done, but this driver is only doing the minimalistic thing here. And uh, buff prepare, this callback is again issued by VB2 and it does it before queuing it. So we only do a single step here, that is set the plane payload size for every buffer. So, so there's an initialization that's happening. And um, there's a buff queue. This is your VB2 layer calling into the driver, asking you to queue the buffer. Uh, mem2m driver just calls the mem2mem helper function because it will queue it into the mem2mem layer and go into the, the ready queue, right? That's, that's the only step that's done here. Uh, there is a start streaming for VB2. We don't really need to do anything here, but we are maintaining a sequence number, so that's being reset uh, at a start stream, so that you get an incremental one once we start streaming. In the start streaming, what's happening is uh, we are kind of draining the queues, and we are just returning all the buffers back to the VB2 layer. So here are the IOCTL ops. Uh, every V4L2 device has, has a V4L2 IOCTL, so that, that's what's been shown over here. And the most important ones here are the format related. That's the only one this driver implements. But depending on your driver, you might have more. You could even have uh, controls and other sorts of things. But this driver is very simple. It doesn't do that. So we do have uh, like format enum, uh, G format, tri format, and S format. And because this particular device has the same uh, capability on both the output as well as the capture side, the same set of uh, ioctal calls are used. Because, and they, since, since they operate on their specific data structures that we saw earlier, that can work. So let's take a very quick look at the try format. So this is supposed to uh, validate any format and make any corrections as possible. So it's, it's basically doing a bounce check to seeing what's the maximum and minimum resolutions this driver can support. And if it exceeds it, it's trying to fix it. Any other device constraint, device specific constraint must go here. But because it's relying on the STB library, it's very flexible. So there's not much other than the max uh, uh, format. And that's also artificially introduced for the purposes of uh, not having a very large buffer. Uh, then the enum is basically telling there's only one format supported, and it's going to report the one that is supported. The G format returns whatever is there, uh, and the S format would essentially call try format, fix the format, and then set it. So that, that's what it would do. Uh, the most important 
uh, call back here is device run. This is where the job actually comes, uh, a set of buffers come and it is handed over to the, to the actual uh, driver, right? So here, here what's happening is uh, you, you go through the driver programming sequence as, as we saw in the data sheet. Uh, we reset the, the scaler. Uh, we configure the input uh, width, height, output width, height, stride. We program those registers over here. Um, and and for, for the input and output registers, uh, uh, addresses, right, uh, the DMA addresses for that, we'd, we'd, we'd get the, the, what do you say, it through the VB2 API. And then finally, we do the start processing by hitting that, that start processing bit, which is shown over here. So once the job is complete, like we mentioned earlier, the device would issue a, a, an, an interrupt. So we have an IRQ handler, threaded IRQ handler that we saw earlier. So the first step here is to read the status bits from, from, from the status and control register and determine if this job has been successful or not. And accordingly, the VB2 uh, uh, status variable is being updated. And once this happens, then this is really when we remove the buffer from the, the ready queues because now it has been processed, so we remove those out, and uh, we update the sequence number, and we finally return these buffers back to the VB2 layer. And once that is done, we call a V4L2 M2M job finish. This would remove the context from the job queue, and then the next eligible context is ready to run. So let's take a look at the, uh, as the application. Uh, so for the test application, uh, I used libcamera API, and one of the reasons for it is because it has a really good uh, C++ API, uh, not uh, for, even for mem to mem devices. So uh, it could have been done using other libraries, but I think the, the, the code looks very neat and clean and concise when doing, doing it with the libcamera API. I was also familiar with it at that point, hence I decided to just use uh, libcamera here. So in this, uh, in this you see a, a very simple class. It's called mem to mem scalar. And it has two public APIs, uh, one being the constructor. So when you construct the object, you give it an input size and an output size. Uh, that's, that's what is required. Uh, it only has one format, so all, only configuration you do here is the size. And then there is a run, um, run API, which would do the job. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the details of that later. Let's look at some of the private data structures. So there is a device enumerator uh, structure here. Uh, and there is also a media device and an M2M device. So these are all abstractions provided by, by libcamera. And you have a vector of capture buffers, output buffers. You have some, some integers here that are counting. The, these are like frame counters. Uh, this is just to determine when to stop, stop the application. At some point, it has to stop and uh, stop streaming, right? Uh, these are uh, cached uh, size variables which we take from the constructor and set inside to, to use later on in the run API. And this application is also trying to test uh, that the buffers and the contents are correct by comparing it against a test vector. Hence, there's a need to map the memory map those buffers. So there's some data structures here to memory map them. This is what the application looks like uh, in total. So there's a, you, you configure an input size which is uh, 640 by 480. Uh, and there's output size of 320 by 240, right? That, those are the two sizes. Um, and then you construct this, this object, mem to mem scalar, and give it the input and output. And finally, you just run. And there's an answer to make sure that the run has been successful. Uh, let's take a look at the constructor itself. So, so in the constructor, we reset the capture frame and output frame counters to zero, as shown here. Uh, we take the size uh, arguments for input and output, and we store, cache them locally into the class variables, input size underscore and output size underscore. Uh, then we create a device, device enumerator object, and uh, we start enumerating all the devices, and after it's enumerated, uh, we'd search using this device match. Uh, this is again all lib camera API, but there's a way to search for it. Because we added media controller support to our driver, so you can, media controller has a discovery API. So that's kind of what is being used here to find your device data. There are other ways to do it, uh, maybe through sysfs of v4l2, but 
this is a better way to do it because it's, this already has a better support for, for finding your device. So that, that's kind of what's happening here. Um, that's probably the only reason why this driver is using media controller. It's not using the request API or anything else, but mostly just to, to just to, for this application to be able to find it. Uh, so you call into the search uh, API of the enumerator and to which you give the device match object. And if it's found, well and good, otherwise we assert. Uh, let's look at the run function. So over here, uh, you can we are using a buffer count of one, but you could you could you could use up to as as many as you want. The driver also has a way to decide how many buffers, uh, minimum buffers it requires. Uh, I don't think it has a way for it to tell maximum, but yeah, it can specify a minimum number buffer count. And uh, so over here now we 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 grab hold of the media entity. Uh, by using the m2ms source. This is a string that you can actually see this if you type the media controller minus p uh, and give the name of your media device. It, it'll list this name. So that, that name you grab and put it over here. So that, that helps you to find the media entity. And the entity has a device node. So that's that you use that to, to get a pointer to the m2m scaler. And uh, now m2m scaler has a capture node and a v and an output node, so you get those two video devices out out from from that you know m to m scalar data structure. And the next thing is to set up the formats, right? So like I said, this is a very simple device; it has only a single format. So what we do is we do a get format on it, and then whatever size it returns, we just take that and uh, what do you say uh, modify it uh, to and assign the cached size variables that we had set up, uh, like, yeah, club objects that we had cached earlier in the constructor. And once we have done that, we call a set format on the capture side as well as the output side. So that's kind of what's happening over here. Uh, the next thing is to set up the callbacks. So uh, so we need to, an in-leap camera that uses something like a um, Q, QT style, you know, signal slot kind of a thing. So, and then you use, just a, so this is basically like a slot that you're installing for that signal. So we, we give it some uh, capture, uh, you know, there's a receive capture buffer and an output buffer complete. That's, that's those are the two callbacks that you do. Then the next thing is to queue all the buffers. So we'll start off with the capture side and we queue all the buffers. There's an additional thing we do here. We set a buffer cookie. This is so that, uh, uh, later on in the callback, we'd, we'd, we'd reference this uh, to find out what is the memory mapped uh, address uh, of, of, of that particular buffer. And it is, uh, I'll come back to this later. Uh, and then over here, we, we, we map those buffers using, again, yet another lib camera helper class that helps you to map it. And it creates a span object. So those span objects are then uh, put onto its own vector over here. Now we do the same thing with the output buffers as well, uh, and make sure that everything is uh, is memory mapped as well, right? Uh, additional thing we do with the output side is uh, we we now feed it our test vector. So for test vector, I use the big big bug bunny, the open source movie, like a, a, an image from there. I converted it into an RGB raw file, and uh, and also changed it into a header using XXD, and that that array is basically getting copied here. So that's, this is your input, known input test vector. Uh, and after, mem after doing a memory map, you mem copy the known, known input into it. And, and then uh, right after that, you also uh, queue the buffer, right? And uh, after that, there's two things to do. You need to stream on the capture side as well as the uh, output side. So both, both need to be done. O only after doing this will your uh, application or start to work. The driver will reject if, if only one of them is turned on. Its eligibility is not met yet. Uh, the rest of the application you install like a kind of like a busy busy loop, uh, uh, event loop I should say actually. So so you you have some sort of a timer which is evaluating if uh, that, so that you, you get an opportunity to exit and if nothing you just call the event loop of lib camera. Uh, that would start monitoring all those FDs on both the output and the capture side. And that's how your callback mechanism is working, right? Um, and then finally, when we, there is a break, sit, there is an exit criteria here. So we, as, so as soon as we capture four frames, we break out. Uh, 
and uh, and then once you're done that we stream off uh, both the capture as well as the output side let's take a look at the callbacks itself so so the output co uh, buffer callback is is pretty simple so we just take whatever buffer is coming in and queue it back there's nothing more to be done here we already copied in the known input test vector so this is simply needs to be queued on the receive catch up capture buffer side we're doing an additional test here we're trying to see that whatever uh, scaled output downscaled output the the driver or the hardware generated does it match with our known test vector so that's there's a mem compare function here and there's an assert added to it just to make sure that it all works fine and and then after that it's the that buffer is queued back into the capture queue So yeah, uh, if anybody is interesting in in uh, reproducing this system, uh, all the code is on GitHub. Uh, I've used Yocto uh, for for building this uh, specific Yocto distro is known as the YoE distro. So I have a fork of it, a branch called ELC 2022. So this, if you run through this, you should be able to reproduce these results. And those are the references. Uh, kernel v for l2 documentation, scalar data sheet, the scalar driver itself, uh, the test application, and if anybody is interested also how the device was emulated on KMO. So there's links to all of it over here. Okay, so we have nine minutes so far. Any, if any questions from the audiences? Okay, okay, let me repeat the question. He's asking, could, could GStreamer do some of these, uh, these steps here and, uh, instead of V4L2 M2M? Uh, yeah, GStreamer, uh, I'm not a big expert on GStreamer, but from the way I understand it, it's, it's, it's a plugin architecture, right? So, so it, can, uh, it might have some software-based plugins which can do scaling, but it can also sit on top of a driver framework like this. Uh, so that also could be that also could be done. So, so yeah, you could use GStreamer, I believe. Yes, it's possible. It's possible. Yes, right. I have not tried it though. But yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you use a scaling of two to one in this example? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's just repeat the question once. Uh, he's asking if there's, uh, because this is using a two to one scaling ratio, but if you use something like a fraction 1.5, 1.6, uh, would there be any performance implication or quality degradations and things like that, right? Yeah, those things are uh, valid questions. Uh, it is applicable to uh, real hardware scaler. Those things might might have some implications, but this is an emulated device, so, it, it, it ultimately calls inside the KMO, I mean, to, to the driver and the application, it, it looks like it's true hardware, but under the hood in KMO, it's making a call into the SDB image resize library, which is software. So uh, I, I did not write that, I just fetched it from somewhere, but I, th I, th I think it, 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 it doesn't have those restrictions like the ones you're mentioning. Those are, those are typically applicable to a real, real hardware scaler. Any, any other questions? Oh, yeah. Performance data, uh, not, I do not actually, because this is not a real hardware. I have emulated on, or it on KMO. But, uh, but I have some experience on working with this with real hardware. So, so the most of the latencies will be from the hardware itself. Uh, the V4L2 layer does does have a few latencies, but but those are very 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 minimal. It's just pretty efficient framework actually. So if you if you have a video IP, and you want, there are a lot of good features here like the you know the stability of V4L2. You also have the the multi-context support. These are all pretty hard to to develop by yourself. So so I I mean. When I looked at it, I was like, hey, this, is, this is really good if you have an IP that kind of meets this criteria. So, so, so it's, it's probably a very apt choice. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Well, we have five more minutes. <laughs> if there's any other questions, or, or is there anything I should go over once again in the slides? Or like, we, since we have five minutes, more that's not clear. Or yeah. There was uh, one uh, format time. Uh, in the application. Or in the in the application or the driver. Hmm? Okay, back, okay. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> you're right, actually. So this, this in a way you're it's like a mem copy function if you if you didn't change the input and output size because they are the same, right, to start with. You're right, you're right about that. But typical, this is just so that, I mean, I mean, a knowledgeable application writer would go and change them, so, but, but you have to provide some defaults just in case, right, so it doesn't crash. So if you were to implement it as is, it's like a, a giant mem copy with lots of framework called, that was unnecessary. But, but it is going to call the STB function and try to do a resize of the same size, which essentially not required, but yeah. No, I do not have a demo. <laughs> that would have been cool though, but yeah. Cool, thanks, thanks everyone. If there are no more questions, I guess we can probably end four minutes early. Thanks everyone.